All right, uh, we'll get started. Um, thanks everybody for joining us today. Uh, we're still expecting some more people, so we'll just add them as they come. Um, yeah, so today we have a very special guest. Uh, we have Dong Ping Wong from Food New York. Uh, yeah, I guess maybe just a quick introduction before we jump into the lecture of what uh, Brown Bag is. Um, for anybody that doesn't go to McGill, uh, Brown Bag is basically our student-run lecture series. Uh, we have it every semester. Um, normally, it's an in-person event uh, where we have lectures in our lunch breaks during studio. Students can bring their lunch uh, and sit in and listen on professionals, give talks on uh, different ideas and projects um, in creative disciplines. Uh, yeah, so today we have Dong joining us. Um, yeah, I'll hand it off to you. <laughs> Uh, um, thanks for getting on, everybody. Um, let's share screen real quick. All right. Um, cool. I hope everybody can see the big purple screen um, and hope everybody is doing all right. So first is um, hi from the US where we are just a mess right now. So it's actually kind of fun to talk to people not from the US or maybe some people are also from the US, but um, I love after this to kind of get your perspective that's <laughs> going on with our own country. So the, um, the, when Brown Bad asked for a title, um, I guess you guys asked maybe like a month ago, uh, the title I came up with was okay, now what? And it was, it was very much um, just a question of as designers, as architects, what could our role possibly be, if any, what could we possibly do? Obviously this is very directly related to things that are happening in the US, you know, with the last four years of the Trump administration, um, but certainly specific to 2020 um, with COVID and all the protests around Black Lives Matter. But um, it's also funny to be giving this talk, I think a day after uh, the inaugurations that just happened here and what everybody wants to feel and believe there's a bit of optimism and hope anyway, coming back into the country, but we'll see. Um, anyway, but I, I feel like this questioner as a title still stands, but um, for myself, I kind of wanted to go back real quick in very recent history and just look at um, the part, I guess, that architecture played in, again, our very, very recent history, whether it was kind of public spaces that got emptied out because of the pandemic and then got retaken over um, for protests, which lasted in, in kind of globally and in, in for a lot of a uh, like a really concentrated sector, I'd say, in like the spring summer months, obviously, but was incredible to see. I think the takeover of of kind of all sorts of spaces around the city in New York. Um, I live. Wait, which way are we facing? Sorry, I actually live behind this photo. I thought we were facing the wrong way. Um, but then also, kind of more broadly, I think the use of infrastructure architecture for either hateful or just completely asinine reasons, and those same things turned even temporarily into kind of sites of fun or joy or connection. Um, and then very recently, I think the same exact building, same exact steps, same exact TV tower that's there in the front two weeks ago, um, yesterday, I think being sites of, of um, pretty profound, I think joy across a lot of sectors and just um, also amazing outfits. Um, but, I think it was, you know, it's funny, very, very quickly just going through these references or through these photos. Um, it's hard to say whether architecture, I, mean, I certainly wouldn't say architecture necessarily caused any of these things, maybe the border wall a little bit, um, but certainly it had a role to play. It had the very least was a stage set for a lot of these things to happen, um, symbols for a lot of these things to happen. And and so I think that, okay, now what was very much like, all right, as practitioners, as designers, as students, um, what could we do um, either directly or indirectly um, relating to some of the things that are actually going on uh, <laughs> very intensely around the world? And I don't pretend like this lecture has any answers to it. I think it's just looking back at some of the ways that we might have approached it in our work um, and how we practice. Um, and it's divided basically into two parts, basically the designs that we do, um, that we hope to affect some sort of change 
and then the practice itself, I think the process that we go through. Uh, but I wanted to introduce the studio um, before getting into that. So we're called Food New York. Um, and it's kind of a range of projects early on actually with all speculative work directly dealing with how structures deal with the environment. Um, and so I call the studio an environmental design studio. It's actually a takeoff. I went to undergrad in Berkeley and the program there is called the College of Environmental Design. Um, so I just kind of took that. And what I really like anyway is that the consideration is very much about kind of what happens on the outside of a building, that world that the building is part of um, as important or even primary to what happens on the inside of a building. So that kind of environment that you're creating. Um, again, this was just a spiral tower that had a lot of micro wind turbines sort of running up it. That same concept to a much smaller scale housing development in Dallas. Um, it was one of the first early projects um, that I worked on, which was a competition for a pedestrian bridge in Slovenia. Um, <clears throat> and then one of the first sort of real clients we had was uh, Kanye West. And we started working with him in 2013. Um, we haven't worked with him for a couple of years now, but one of the first projects we did was for a stage set um, during the Yeezus album for the Yeezus tour. It led into us designing um, him and Kim's homes, a couple in LA and one in Paris, as well as a bunch of probably 50 different retail concepts for the Yeezy stores, which um, never ended up going anywhere, but were fun anyway. Um, that led to work with uh, Virgil Abloh and his brand Off-White, and so we designed the first handful of stores starting in 2015. This is one in Hong Kong. Um, this is one in Singapore, uh, and then the New York store. Um, oh, and actually, one thing that started coming out of the work, especially in this period, was, I mean, dumbly, just the use of plants, but the idea of um, either bringing in outdoor space or certainly opening up um, otherwise commercial, sort of very tightly sealed commercial space in the outdoors. You can see some of these. And so I think it's a, it's a funny natural extension, although a bit of a leap. Um, we're working now on a project in the Cayman Islands um, for a bathhouse, and it's an outdoor bathhouse that is uh, basically completely made out of hedges. And so the idea is you've almost taken this giant um, uh, table, not table, giant sort of pad of hedges and carved out space. Um, you wind your way through and all of the different kind of small components of this bathhouse um, are located in this, this landscape basically. Um, but that's, so that's a quick summary of the office. Um, this version of the office uh, food was started in 2018. It comes off the back of an office. I started with a friend of mine named Juana called Family. Um, and when we went our separate ways, um, I basically just changed the name of food. Um, but back to the, the topic, I suppose, or the question of the lecture, um, I wanted to start with um, what's been really helpful for me anyway was a couple passages from a lecture that um, at a, a civil rights leader named Whitney M. Young Jr. gave at the um, American Institute of Architects Convention in 1968. And so he's giving this to a room of architects, um, you know, leaders in the profession, and basically calling them out. And, and um, if you bear with me to read a few of these passages, I, all the things in italics were originally you. So he's talking to the profession and I just changed it to we. Um, so as a profession, uh, we're not a profession that has distinguished itself by our social and civic contributions to the cause of civil rights. And I'm sure this has not come, as any, uh, come to us as any shock. Uh, we're most distinguished by our thunderous silence and our complete irrelevance. So again, he's literally telling, I think, the most prominent architects in the US that they've been fucking up. Um, now, we have a nice normal escape hatch in our historical ethical code or something that says, after all, we are the designers and not the builders. Our role is to give people what they want. Um, now, that's a nice, easy way to cop out, but I've read about architects who have courage, who have had social sensitivity. I can't help but wonder about an architect that builds some of the public housing that I see in the cities of this country, how he could even compromise his own profession and his own sense of value. So I've built 35 or 40 story buildings these vertical slums and not even put a restroom in the basement and leave enough recreational space for about 10 kids when there must be 5,000 in the building. That architects as a profession wouldn't as a group stand up and say something about this is disturbing to me. Um, we're employers, we're key people in the planning of our cities today. We share the responsibility for the mess we are in terms, um, for the mess we are in terms of the white noose around the central city. It didn't just happen, we didn't just suddenly get in this situation, it was carefully planned. Um, so obviously that's a, that's a pretty direct uh, admonishment, I think of the profession. And um, what I wanted to do, I think off of that was again, split the talk into two halves, one about the product as in the things that we, we make in the office. Um, 
and then the practice itself in ways that we're looking at um, how we work as people, I suppose. Um, so that the project projects I chose in this section are almost all projects that we self-initiated to some degree. Um, and I think it was, it's the, the Whitney Young quote, especially the last one I think was relevant in terms of the kind of responsibility that we have as, as architects um, and what our role is in actually generating ideas and actually generating the priorities of what our work should be about. So um, this was a project in Chinatown. Our office is about four blocks away in New York. And it was to, to there's this kiosk there that's the tourist kiosk. This is kind of one of the first things you see when you come into Chinatown. Um, DOT, Department of Transportation, had put out a call for proposals to redo this kiosk. They sort of kind of gussy it up. Um, and, but I took it as, as a resident of Chinatown, as sort of uh, our office being employers in Chinatown, to use it as a way to like, can we redefine what the identity of Chinatown is away from a dragon <laughs> sitting on top of a red box, basically. And so I don't know if anybody's familiar with New York Chinatown, uh, but like a lot of Chinatowns, it's, it's quite um, difficult to navigate in terms of the streets are quite congested. They don't follow the grid pattern anymore. There's a China signage. Um, and unless you're a kind of resident, it's very easy to get lost. Uh, it's also located very centrally in Manhattan. And more importantly, it's surrounded by some of the most um, expensive property in all of New York. So there's like Soho, Tribeca, Wall Street to the south, um, Lower East Side, which is gentrifying incredibly quickly, if not already past that point of gentrification. Um, but Chinatown has been able to maintain an identity, very Chinese identity, well beyond just the tourism side. And a lot of it's down to how the properties are owned by different conglomerates, but we don't need to get into that. But what I wanted to do was um, find a way, or what we wanted to do was find a way to kind of locate yourself in Chinatown. I think both physically to see where you're at, but also um, sort of politically to understand the role and the place making of Chinatown within the city. So um, we installed uh, as this golden tower, or we proposed this golden tower. And it's really just an observation tower. Um, that red kiosk would otherwise sit here or currently sits here. Um, and the entire idea was that, A, it's a beacon, I think, from around the city that you can easily kind of navigate and, again, locate yourself as you come nearer to Chinatown or within Chinatown, but also that you just get, um, very simply, uh, an understanding of the neighborhoods that surround it, and you can find yourself there. Um, also, it's just meant to be this kind of obnoxious uh, thing that would give a very clear indicator that this was sort of an owned and operated kind of place in the city that um, wasn't, was very different from any or every other neighborhood. Um, another project which we've been calling HIGH, or the Health Institute, uh, we started in April, obviously in, in the early stage of the pandemic. And the idea for us, which is still very ongoing, uh, this project, was just to re-examine what health meant, especially in relationship to the environment, to public space. Um, especially back in April, it was very much that, you know, when you would walk down the street and see someone else, if you were outside of your house at all, you know, everybody would kind of like shift six feet around each other. Um, the idea of your bodies in public space was quite odd and probably still is. And so these are some of the hotels, I saw hotels, these are some of the hospitals um, in and around New York. And the, the immediate observation we saw was, um, this was also during that period where, where like we're going through again now, hospitals are just being overwhelmed. And so the architecture of a hospital just became these hugely important hubs, um, for the city that everybody in some way had a relationship to these physical things even if you weren't going you were very very aware of where these were um, in your neighborhood but the immediate observation was that they're these giant um blocks of buildings and so we thought is there a way that we could open these up again open it up to the environment open it up to the public space was there a way that you could make health um part of public life very different than say stepping out of your public life getting treated in a hospital and getting ejected back into the street um, like again, kind of bringing the city through through health in that way. And so we've just been exploring different typologies, different kind of building masses, different ways of making healthcare um, sort of as fluid as walking down the street or as fluid as visiting your local park, that it's something to take care of daily as opposed to um, just concern when you have an emergency or certainly when you have a pandemic raging. Uh, but this is very much an ongoing project. Um, and it, it's evolved quite a bit, um, whether we're doing a tower or not, where the site sits, we have a couple of places we're looking at in Chinatown. Um, and we started to engage some of the nonprofits in Chinatown um, that we've had conversations with in the last couple of years 
um, what kind of small versions of this can we do? Can we start building um, pop-up versions of this? Can we start building ideas of mixing health, hospital, and community center um, in a place like Chinatown, um, where again, like socializing is, is sort of not existent at the moment. One of the earliest projects uh, we ever did as an initiative is a project called Plus Pool. Uh, this project now is actually a decade old and still ongoing. Um, it's also one of our more well-known projects. Um, basically what it is, is a giant Olympic sized pool that filters, actually it says 600,000 gallons here. It's actually about a million gallons of river water every day. Um, the whole intent is that you could swim maybe for the first time in about a hundred years in clean river water um, in the middle of New York City without the use of chemicals. Um, <clears throat> and obviously, uh, it used to be a place you could swim, but, but for various reasons you can't um, in the East River, let alone the Hudson anymore. Um, but it's, it's hard to remember, at least for me, it was very easy to forget that Manhattan anyway is an island. You know, New York City is a coastal city, um, but it doesn't feel that way. It certainly doesn't feel like you're, you're near a natural body of water. We don't look at the rivers as a natural body of water as much as we look at it like a place to take the subway below or a border between Brooklyn and Manhattan or Brooklyn and Queens, for example, or sorry, Manhattan and Queens. Um, but we just wanted to see if we could create this experience, the idea that you can actually feel the river water in a safe and clean way and experience the city in a different way. Um, and so we started testing filtration. Um, I had zero experience in what water quality testing meant, what filtration meant, but we just started trying things. This was us pumping up East River water um, into a tank in Brooklyn, and you can see the natural color of the water is not particularly appealing. And so we set up a lab, we kind of learned how to water quality test, we learned about 20 different aspects of um, uh, different bacteria and contaminants in the water and, and collected more data than I think we've, or we've known now that I think it's more data than anybody's ever collected on the East River. Um, because what we're doing is we're collecting, we're concerned every 15 minutes about what happens in the water because you're jumping in at any given time. Most data is collected every two weeks to a month to get a universal health of the river. Um, and so we produced all this, all this information and started building more prototypes um, this was in 2015. We launched a very tiny version of the pool into the water uh, to test again. Um, we just finished the patent process and I got approved for a patent about six months ago um, for the filtration system and how it inserts as a cartridge into the pool so that that cartridge can uh, potentially be applied to other pools down the road. Um, and we finally uh, finalized the site. Um, this site is on the Chinatown side, um, completely coincidental that it's the site closest to where I live. Um, that was not at all on purpose, but it's a site. What's really nice is it's, there's very little public space there. There's very little access to um, waterfront recreation. Um, you can see all the, all the projects here that I think are sort of underserved. Um, and so now we're basically just wrestling with the city politically on regulatory issues, but um, we're hoping that it'll be complete in the next four years. But by that point, it'll be a 15 year project. So it's a very slow thing. Anyway, so the other half of the, of the presentation is about the practice side. And one thing that stands out really clearly, um, and again, relating to Whitney M. Young's lecture, is just what the practice looks like. So this is the current board of NCARB. NCARB, I don't remember what it actually stands for, but they're basically the, the country certification board for licensure. Um, basically, this is the, these are the faces that set the rules on who can be an architect or not in the US. Um, and you'll notice the pattern as I click through these slides. Um, these are the deans of some of the top schools, uh, not only in the country, but around the world. Um, this, I believe, I actually can't remember which office. Oh, this is Gensler, sorry. Um, you know, the heads of Gensler. One note, she, uh, these two are the, the main founding principles. She's half black. Um, I think that might be it on this whole list. Um, this is the directorship and leadership of KPF. Uh, you'll start seeing a smattering of Asians, um, a couple of Middle Easterners, but um, very, very, very few, if any, black people. Um, Perkins and Will. So these are all the largest offices around the country. Um, SOM, um, same situation. And then AIA, which again is the American Institute of Architects. Uh, the one black person here is the, um, the student representative. So she represents the student body. Um, so I thought it was funny that the only uh, so black person the AA could bring on to their directorship was from the student side. Um, 
sorry for this crappy slide, but the breakdown is, is funny basically, or funny is not the right word to say, but um, that uh, in the US anyway, you know, we have a 70% white population, 13% black, 7% Latinx, 6% Asian and so on. Asians are actually very well represented actually. Um, that's something that was also, um, I'm curious if it's prevalent there at McGill, but if you see any of the schools here in the US, it's pretty obvious there is um, a solid representation of Asian, Asian Americans, if not overrepresented. But almost every other, every other um, group of color is very, very underrepresented and white is well over indexed. Um, and so, especially given um, following George Floyd's, George Floyd's murder and the kind of protests this last summer, um, colleagues and I and friends of I took, tried to do a couple of different initiatives to see, at least within our profession, could we start addressing these in different ways? Obviously, there's a million things that have to happen, but um, one thing that was very simple to start was uh, we just started a list of um, uh, BIPOC studios, kind of studios led by Black, Indigenous, and people of color. Um, this is still online. It's live. It's public. You can access it. You can add to it. Um, and the intent was driven originally by a student who reached out. Um, she herself was Black, and it actually just quit a major office run by a Black architect, and which actually <laughs> I realized kind of contradicts this list. Um, but was just telling us about all the different like levels of racism she was feeling because all her superiors are white, all of the HR was white, all of the administration were white, even though the head was black. And so we wanted a list where especially young architects, young designers could find offices of people run by, sorry, offices run by people that basically look like them um, and at least have a starting point to understand what kind of offices that, that were there that were just, again, not simply um, white-led. Um, with Esther, who I believe gave a brown bag a little while ago, um, we started uh, Office Hours, which is a weekly series, um, kind of a mentorship series, a Zoom mentorship series, again, um, bringing in uh, BIPOC creatives to just talk about very practical issues of how to, how to navigate the profession. Um, this one's with Jonathan Jackson, who runs a studio called We Should Do It All, um, which is true to name. It's an architecture studio design, branding, uh, graphics, and he obviously talked about what, it's, what it means and what, what his experience was um, being a very young creative entrepreneur, being black, um, being very much pigeonholed into a certain type of work, what it was like now amidst 2020 anyway, suddenly getting all these offers of projects from companies you know, that were ignoring them six months before. Um, and then just talking about practical things like how do you make money? How do you hire? How do you deal with underpayment? all these things, um, it's a really great series. Um, uh, I just, for the latest issue of Pinup, um, I tried to do a kind of classifieds ad version, collecting for myself all of the different um, directories and accounts and information and, and sources um, that I was coming across again over through 2020 that were helping me kind of understand um, what it meant to be an architect of color in an otherwise a very white profession. Um, so, for example, this is a playlist put together by Coop, who runs Hood Mid-Century Modern, which is a, a kind of incredible Instagram account, um, which is basically documenting mid-century and basically just kind of interesting contemporary architecture um, in Black communities and Black neighborhoods that typically get overlooked. Um, I think his goal is eventually set up a real preservation society. Um, and again, this, is, <laughs> this, this playlist is actually really incredible. Um, I think you can find it through his, his Spotify probably. Um, again, a crossword based off the counter canon account. Um, again, just different practitioners and leaders through the years that again are sort of overlooked. Um, so this is, I think, in the latest issue of, of Pinup. Um, and then uh, with the office a couple years ago, we, we had an opportunity to take over a storefront a few blocks away from the office and started a thing called Food Radio. Um, we basically built out, oh, sorry, uh, our office is in this building in Chinatown. The food radio site, I believe, was somewhere around here. Um, and Bella, who I think is on this call, really spearheaded this effort. And basically, the whole idea was to take an abandoned storefront, build a very minimal um, workspace in there, um, and invite anybody in the community, any student, anybody that wanted to come by, that wanted a place to work, just to come by and hang out. And so we moved a bunch of our library in there. Um, we provided some tools. Um, to design if you wanted out of the space. And then we also installed a mini kind of radio station in the back. Um, and the radio station 
was not only recording activities happening in the space, but we invited a bunch of our friends and collaborators and people that we really admire um, just to come in and again, talk about very practical matters. So this is Angela de Mayuga, who's a chef, um, helped start uh, the New York branch of Mission Chinese um, and asked her what it was like, again, being a, a Filipino American um, about cooking her own food, cooking other people's food, about, again, making money. The only central question we had for everybody or the only, only um, set question we had was how did you make your first dollar? Um, and we thought it was really important to showcase that you could be a creative person. You could actually do the kind of work that you wanted to do and actually make a living from it. Um, and this was really important for me, especially being in the neighborhood of Chinatown where there's a, a huge amount of, of kids in poverty. And there's a very classic trend, obviously, of taking over like your family restaurant or the typical dream of wanting your parents wanting to be a doctor or a lawyer or whatever it might be. And so we wanted examples that um, you could actually survive and thrive doing kind of the things you wanted to do. Um, and so the list was primarily composed of, again, people of color. We tried to involve as many women as possible just because I think that was also fairly underrepresented, especially in the um, uh, communities of color and just ask them those same questions and just have these conversations. So it was all live, um, but we recorded all of them and you can actually still visit the site radio.food-new York. Um, and I think this was a, a precursor to even the work done on the BIPOC studio list, the work done on office hours, um, but open those conversations. Um, and lastly, I wanted to return to Plus Pool because I realized that um, how we're operating or how we're kind of running through Plus Pool is also in a way um, trying to approach the practice quite differently. And so the project started as an idea, Oops. Uh, a very dumb idea, a very simple idea to have a funny shaped pool. And the shape kind of came around just with four pools stuck together. And the idea was that um, there's a lap pool, a, a pool for sports, um, a pool for just hanging out on the right, and a pool for kids, which goes from zero to three feet. Um, and for example, I, I grew up near the beach in San Diego. I grew, up near, I grew up surfing. I love being near the ocean, but I actually hate being in pools. Um, and a lot of it's because of um, the sort of artificiality of the water in the pool. And so we wanted to create a pool that was that felt very different for anybody that isn't a sort of born swimmer. And there's was, there was like 50 or 60% of the population oftentimes doesn't know how to swim with actual natural water, that there was a kind of place for everybody in this pool. Um, and, but it was started off, again, just as an idea. Uh, this was when I'd first started a uh, family with Juana, but we didn't have any paying clients or anything. So we just had time. Um, and I was freelancing at the time. and. So with our friends PlayLab, uh, they helped us launch a website and a book and a newsletter. And the whole idea was just to get the word out and see if anybody thought this was a good idea. The back of this pamphlet, which I apologize for the low resolution, there's literally a list of says, that says, we're trying to build a floating pool. We need help from, and we listed 20 different engineering disciplines that we thought were relevant. Um, for example, we listed water engineer, which actually is not really a discipline that exists, we realized, um, but like filtration expert, um, naval architect, like all these things. And eventually we actually picked up a, a ton of press just by putting those images out in the world. Um, it, was, it was fortunate that I think we launched it in a, very, a really hot summer. And we also realized that New Yorkers just love talking about themselves. So anything in New York that's interesting, New York press is all over it. Um, but we were able to get a ton of press. Uh, we got a, a sort of shout out in a weird way from Letterman before he retired. Um, and we turned that into running two Kickstarters. This is when Kickstarter was very early. The idea of crowdfunding was still novel. Um, and at the time we were, both of these rounds were the largest crowdfunding project for any civic or public project at the time. Um, the project as a whole is a $25 million capital project. So obviously 40 grand and 270 grand are not paying for the building of the project. What it did pay for though is the testing that you saw earlier and the ability for us to keep developing it. And so we kept going with these campaigns. We have a campaign now to buy a tile that goes onto the pool um, mainly because we wanted a sort of ownership over the entire project from all the supporters that gave $25 up to $2,500. Um, we've since been able to start a swim program that we've run for the last four or five years, um, teaching kids eight to 12 that have never had an opportunity to learn how to swim. And this is purely because we ended up meeting all these Olympic swimmers and swim facilities in the city who were able to donate time and lessons um, to these kids. Um, and it was for us, it was a good opportunity to make some funny merch. Um, we work with STEM programs in the city. Uh, we started some school curriculums. 
And then in 2019, we launched this in the water, which is called Plus Pool Light. It's a mini version of the pool. It's obviously not meant to be swam in, but what it does is it changes light colors depending on what the given quality of the river water is. Um, and so this was one of many steps towards getting the full Plus Pool built. Um, and we're targeting now, um, maybe this year, it's a long shot, but maybe this year, if not next year, just back here building the first time we actually get a pool that you can swim in river water into the river. Um, it'll be a much smaller version of Plus Pool. It, will be, um, it won't have the full filtration capacity. Um, but for us, I think it was as important psychologically that you can touch the water even intermittently um, when the river is clean um, as it is actually understanding all the science and the kind of sustainability aspects behind it. Um, but maybe the, for me anyway, one of the more interesting aspects of the project or most interesting aspects of the project besides just the design itself is that we kind of accidentally, if this is your typical trajectory, I guess, where a city's policy enables a client to purchase a property and determine what to build through zoning or through uh, certain rights, that client obviously has sources for funding, um, purchases that site, builds the team, and eventually you end up with the design that gets built. We sort of did that all backwards. So we had a design that wasn't cited, did not have a team, did not have money, and through that built or found or were approached by teams or approached by sites. Um, now we've built a funding mechanism. The client is still very much the people of New York, so there's not really like a client per se. And then the policy side, uh, we actually are affecting in, in discussions with the Department of Health and um, Department of uh, Environmental Conservation to rewrite laws about what is deemed a swimming pool or not. Um, right now, for example, to call yourself a swimming pool, you have to put in chemical disinfectant, you have to put in chlorination. So we're proving, or we're trying to prove to them anyway, that um, you can achieve the same level of cleanliness and safety without chemicals. Um, and so that's quite exciting that we may actually be inventing a whole new definition of, of a pool. Um, but just to kind of close up, I suppose, um, I wanted to come back to this quote, which is that last quote from, from Whitney Young um, before. And again, I think that certainly this was an admonishment in the context of his speech, but this may be me trying to be hopeful after yesterday's inauguration, but I also find actually a lot of like impetus to change how we work in a really positive way. Um, that we can actually take that kind of responsibility. There's methods that we can try to take that kind of responsibility to build and design the kind of spaces and, and places and cities that we want. Um, it was carefully planned. And I think that's actually really important to keep in mind that people planned the worst parts of the cities, which also means conceivably people can plan the best parts of the city. And all the work I think that we're doing, um, I, I wouldn't say, you know, I wouldn't make it so grand that we're really um, addressing a lot of these things that need to address at a much higher level than we're able to do. But I think what's been really fun in the office is that um, we've just been trying things, even if they're very small conversations. Um, and I think that way of working through an initiative um, has allowed us to try things that may work or may not work, that may lead to much larger conversations or may stay very small um, without being completely beholden to what a client may want to do. Anyway, um, so I, again, I don't think there's a real clear answer to that, okay, now what? With the exception that I think, um, as architects, I think we're training, you guys, I guess, are in the middle of your training, especially to look at cities, I think, in ways that nobody else really looks at and have that kind of agency um, to just put designs and ideas out in the world um, instead of just waiting for someone to ask you to do something. Um, so I'll, I'll end there. Um, I mean, I, if anybody has any questions, I'm more than happy to go back to any slides in the lecture. Um, but I mean, I don't know if you want to start off with the q and I'm actually just always very curious where students that are in the midst of school are about to graduate, what kind of optimism, if any, um, people are having with the profession, coming into the profession with what they think they can do um, as architects. But um, I'll shut up for a minute. Uh, okay. Yeah, thank you so much. Uh, that was very interesting and very relevant, um, especially given very recent events uh, and also just 2020 in general. Uh, I think moving into 2021, this is a great way to start off the series for the semester. Um, I, yeah, I actually had a couple of questions uh, that I want to ask. Sure. Um, yeah, I guess for people in the call that were at our lecture with 
Esther Che last semester. Um, she actually collaborates uh, with Dong, I believe, to run Office Hours. Um, and she's one of the creators. Uh, and I guess, yeah, like we were interested to hear a lot more about that and like how initiatives like Office Hours that you've run uh, has really translated into your practice or inspired collaborations um, or the kind of impact you're even seeing it has on uh, students in the field um, and professionals uh, that have been approaching you. Um, yeah, I guess moving into 2021 as well, like if there's any upcoming projects it's led into or, yeah, that's kind of my first question. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, things like Office Hours or the BIPOC list or Food Radio, um, the most direct impact that's kind of the dream, I guess, in some ways is literally just uh, students saying that it's amazing just to see again, see someone that looks like them that's that found a way to sort of achieve an office or found a way to do the kind of work they wanted to do and also hear them very direct. I think what's nice about those formats. So for example, with the office hours, with office hours, it was limited to um, not only BIPOC creatives, but actually BIPOC audience. And one of the reasons for that was that um, to allow really open and vulnerable conversations about race and about um, kind of emotionally really fraught things that a lot of the creators have been through. And obviously also try to invite um, the students on the call to share experiences that they felt comfortable with it. Um, I certainly, I mean, when I was coming up, I don't think I ever, you know, like I, had, I, re I realized I had one professor in my entire undergrad and grad experience that was not white. Um, and she was a Thai woman and, and actually coincidentally or not, I think the best professor I ever had. Um, and I think going through schools, so there's just not a lot of visibility. There's not a lot of places where I think you can feel like you can talk about how weird shit gets in the middle of a studio or, or conversations you may have with professors that just feel fucked up. Um, I think directly, like in the list, for example, a few people have said actually that the list did lead directly to jobs. Like that's awesome. Like that they got, they found an office or through that they found another office and now they're working for an office that they're much happier in, they're much more comfortable in. Um, but I think like on the whole, you know, I don't, I don't know what kind of like direct effects except that um, you can hear from people that have gone through similar experiences that maybe you might be feeling now. and hopefully offer some practical advice. Like, yeah, how do, you, how do you pitch to a client how much you wanna charge them? How do you even determine how much to charge someone for work? How do you negotiate a better salary? Um, how do you um, position your CV so you, you don't get overlooked? Like really practical things sometimes just entering the profession. I think those are always really important to share. Uh, again, especially coming from perspectives that are not your typical perspective. I don't know if that addressed your question, but <laughs> yeah, no, definitely. Um, I think yeah, it's quite interesting because actually, uh, just yesterday um, we had a meeting at our school uh, where our, the director of our school. There's kind of like a task force being developed right now to address uh, issues of systemic racism uh, in our program, uh, in our faculty, in the research. Um, so this is definitely very relevant. Uh, and I guess just like on that note as well, like, do you have have you developed like very, uh, I guess, like practical ideas of like how you see schools should best approach uh, changing the system? Like what are the, I guess, most direct things that schools can start doing right now? Um, I mean, I would say that I have not developed anything, um, but I've at least been able to come across people and sometimes they're just, for example, like the, um, I think it's called the Black Student Alliance, which I think might be across a number of certainly US schools. I'm curious if they're international. Um, but for example, they helped write a response to the Dean of GSD uh, about what they wanted to see. And um, it, was, it was some very obvious, clear things like more uh, people of color in leadership positions. Um, like dumbly, I would just love to see the deans not just be all white 
as much as we can get. So more deans of color, I think, more professors of color, um, but even like making sure that the curriculum being taught, you know, they demanded 50% of the curriculum should be of non white or Eurocentric kind of curriculum, that the library should start carrying more books that were not Eurocentric. Um, the lecture series needed 50% um, color. So there's some very practical things that um, they were recommending that I think some schools are trying to take on. Like I know that GSAP at Columbia where I went, this year's entire lecture series is run by a collective of black architects all the lectures invited by a collective of black architects. Um, so there's starts, there's small starts. One of the things that we, or I learned um, was, I don't remember the exact year, mid sixties, I think in the midst of the civil rights movement then, uh, the Ford, either literally the Ford as a corporation or Ford Foundation issued a huge amount of grant money for um, black and Puerto Rican students to get scholarships at, uh, if not only architecture schools, just a lot of these top tier schools. And so for five years, there was this huge mass, I think 50% of the student body was either black or Puerto Rican. So a lot of the kind of like, um, now we look back and the established black architects coming out of that period were because specifically of that financial grant, like that mechanism of like, well, let's just, let's just get rid of the financial hurdle. That's one of the many hurdles, but if we get rid of that, um, and out came, you know, all these incredible architects, all these incredible leaders, civil rights wise in the architecture world. So I think there's also mechanisms like that that are very direct, um, certainly much more direct than just kind of like talking about it <laughs> all the time. Okay, yeah. Um, yeah, I, guess I have another follow up question to that. Uh, yeah, it was just interesting because um, yesterday in our call with the director, uh, the question came up of like how how do you gauge uh, when staff are being inclusive enough uh, with their teaching and like with their research? Um, because like the, the topic came up of like changing the curriculum uh, so that classes are not Eurocentric anymore um, and take on these different perspectives. Uh, and the response kind of was like, uh, universities still wanna promote uh, freedom of research and like freedom of uh, what professors want to teach uh, and it's like so there wasn't like the drive to like put impose like strict guidelines or penalties on like if professors aren't teaching from these different perspectives uh, so I guess yeah I was just like wondering if you had thoughts about that or how um, I hear that at a certain level it feels a bit like a cop out, um, but I get it. Um, I mean, my initial response was like, all right, then replace those professors. And not necessarily replace those professors that want to teach, like are explicitly wanting to teach non-Western non non, or non-Eurocentric work, but you know, replace those professors with black professors, Asian professors, Latinx professors, and let them lead what the curriculum, let them lead what they think the curriculum should be. Um, I don't know if, I think it's also a bit off base to say like, all right, black professors come and teach <laughs> African architecture. Uh, that's obviously not the right way to do it. But I do think there's something where if you live by that, let me, let me give the freedom of this professor to teach and research what they want to research and teach, that the hope is that at least over a couple turnovers that a school with much larger voice led by professors of color will have a different focus than led by predominantly white professors. Um, I don't know what that is. Um, I don't think it's up to me to determine what that is um, at all. But, you know, right now, I think the representation is so low, let alone, it's so low where like even the professors of color that are there, you know, there's a lot of pressure just to kind of keep the status quo. Otherwise, it's very much kind of like they're just black sheep and the whole thing. So. Um, I do think that kind of promoting into leadership, promoting into decision making, um, professors of color and teachers of color and all that will slowly make a difference, whether you enforce what they teach or not. Okay. Uh, I mean, have you guys, 
I'm, I'm actually curious, have you guys seen any direct action either last semester or this semester? Direct changes in the school? Um, I actually, yeah, that was one of the things the meeting was about yesterday, um, is that there's been extensive reports uh, and studies done into this and the current like problems and like uh, solutions students are thinking of or changes they want to see. Uh, but right now, the, I guess like the school is in the stage of trying to develop like an action plan or task force to start implementing these things. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I don't, I'm not super involved with the school's administration. I don't know if anybody else knows if there's been direct changes that have happened really yet. Uh, yeah, um, but it's definitely a work in progress in our school right now. Um, yeah. I mean, if I could just say, I feel like um, their approach right now is to move at a slower pace. I don't know if that's necessarily the correct way of approaching it. I, they're set to um, have the team finalized only in the summer. So that would be a whole two semesters of not much being accomplished. So maybe um, if you had any suggestions of smaller things like the student body could do on their own or um, um, I don't know, I think the fact that you're doing this brown bag series is already one of those moves. Um, I can imagine um, I can imagine kind of like school or regional specific versions of like what office hours was, which is, you know, to talk about um, really tangible effects within the university and actually have very, very like open conversations. Cause I mean, what you said was, was interesting that like, it makes sense to plan. I think, especially with, you know, trying to really change curriculum in a real serious way in a real honest way, it's gonna take a long time. But I mean, you guys as students are only in the school for four years, maybe, I don't know, I don't know how many years you're there, but you know, like, I can imagine it's probably frustrating to be like, all right, you're gonna wait until I'm done or you're gonna wait until I'm like just sitting around for a year. This isn't even talking about like, I'm sure how weird it is to suddenly be in like Zoom University, like that, that whole thing is fucked up. But I think there's a lot of things you can probably initiate just with like, um, just through the student body in terms of like office hours conversations. I'm sure there's professors. I mean, I hope there's professors within the school that would be open to talking about what their experience as a professor in the school is like, um, or practitioners that have recently started their own practice, or whatever it is, you know, that is, that's interesting. Um, I know that um, whenever I was inviting or talking to, or I'll put it this way, it's the topic of, I think, what it's like, or what you could, how do I put this? Um, different ways of kind of adjusting the practice or changing the practice, especially as a practitioner of color, that is a really great way to, op to um, basically bug designers and practitioners that you don't have a contact to and just be like, hey, would you be interested in talking to a student body here at McGill? Um, I found that a really great way just to reach out to people that I didn't know, just as I think suddenly people are like, oh shit, I actually would have a lot of like personal stories that'd be awesome to, to share. Um, Otherwise, it is hard in school. I mean, I, I, you guys are insanely busy just trying to get through school, let alone trying to do the administration's job. Um, it's not easy. Um, but yeah, I think actually literally like this Brownback series, I think setting up your own version of a lecture series is already pretty huge. Um, I don't expect that you can really like change what the dean wants to do in any quicker beyond protests and letters and things like that. It's hard to do. Um, yeah, if anybody else has. Um, I mean, feel free to ask me questions about anything in the presentation. Um, I'm happy to answer anything. Um, I had a question, which I don't know if anybody, or just, a, I imagine most people here are students, but I'm just very curious how people are feeling if you're near graduation, like coming into practice in the next year or so. 
um, I think it's been a insanely, certainly in the US and, and globally um, with the pandemic and everything else, like it's been a really tumultuous few years and I can imagine confidence is probably a little low in terms of entering a really robust profession. Um, I'm curious if people have been thinking about like alternatives, if people are just like freaking out, if people are just like giving up on architecture or they're actually optimistic in any way. Um, I don't know if anybody's willing to talk about it, but I'm just very curious about that. Um, I can start. I would say as like a third year who's graduating this semester, I would say I'm not super optimistic. I think there's just, after three years in this program, you kind of realize that so much time is, I don't want to say wasted, but so much energy is put into just mostly issues of representation, um, kind of all these aesthetics. Uh, and so I feel like I'm graduating and I don't really have just like the tools to like, I don't want, like, I don't want to change the world. I know I can't really change the world, but it feels like we were kind of raised to be these artists and I don't know how helpful that's going to be like for 2021. Um, I will say, and because Columbia had a very similar thing where there was a sort of like mode of representation that was very much of the school that you kind of like bought into or not. Um, on a broader sense, just to take a little bit away from that, the ability to make something pretty, <laughs> to make something beautiful as an image or a video or whatever uh, is surprisingly powerful. Like I was like the, the plus pull image that I showed earlier, which is like in the cove from the bridge, that one, you know, that's a really straightforward like Rhino to Photoshop job, like things you can probably do in your sleep. It took me like a day but that image basically propelled the project for the last decade. Um, it's an image that I can show someone and they don't have to know what it is. They're like, oh shit, that's cool. And then that's already like a huge open door. We had a board member, we have a board member, he's still on the board. It's my, my favorite story about him. He's awesome, he's an architect. Uh, but for two years of being on the board, which meant he was intimately involved with a lot of stuff, he didn't realize the pool filtered water. He just thought it was like a cool looking pool. And I remember when, when that revelation came out, I was like both incredibly, I was like, the like I was really pissed off that he wasn't paying attention, but then realized he just wanted to be a part of this because of this like image that was made, this sort of like piece of representation that was just like a flat JPEG. Um, but I, that is to say like, I, I think probably the school, I can imagine there's a lot of stuff you probably wanted to get from the school that maybe you didn't get, but that ability to represent stuff beautifully is a huge skill set that I think it's overlooked for political reasons even, like for like actually starting conversations, let alone just, you know, selling some developer apartment. Sorry, not to, not to say that your school's perfect in that way, but it doesn't mean like, I wouldn't overlook that skill set you've actually taken from the school either. Mm -hmm, for sure. I don't know if anyone is more optimistic maybe <laughs> and wants to speak up. Um, to follow up a bit, uh, I feel like I I, re I know it's important representation, but I feel like I've only seen like I've only learned about what is important in architecture like last year, like this semester, and it's my last one. <laughs> like I I wanted to like use architecture to make changes, but I didn't know really how and how important it was before my last semester before graduating, which is like weird. <laughs> I feel like it should be taught a lot earlier. Like, I don't know. Um, I agree. I don't know. I'm trying to think. Like, my most like sort of profound period of education was actually the first two years after I finished school and was working. Um, and I think because I was actually working at a firm that I loved, but I was still coming up, up against things that I really disagreed with, um, either how the offices run or how much people were getting paid or the kind of products they were taken, taking. And oftentimes, I still look back at my actually like education and don't know, and this is probably not gonna be very comforting. It's hard for me to pinpoint 
like which pieces of my education were relevant, which pieces weren't. Um, one thing I will say that was that was relevant was in my undergrad at Berkeley, there was still a big sort of classic like 60s, 70s Berkeley contingent there teaching like this older professorship that was basically the hippie generation that was teaching kind of like a lot of socially conscious and environmentally conscious ideas. And I want to believe that that kind of carried thinly anyway through a lot of the work, but I, it's hard for me to actually pinpoint um, specifically moments in my education, like formal education that were like, oh shit, that's something I learned that was really helpful. Not to say it wasn't helpful, um, but even I don't know <laughs> like which professor was like great in that regard. Like for example, I, one of my favorite student professors at Columbia didn't really teach at all. Like he just kind of like looked at your work and every time he'd present something, he'd just be like, yeah, but what's the point? Like, what do you, what's the point? And weirdly, he asked that over and over and over again, never really provided you an answer on how to answer that question, but realized that like how I was talking about work in school, which I'm curious if you guys also face, is incredibly like circuitous. It's incredibly like theory driven, incredibly complex at a way that 99.9% .9 of the people that you will ever talk to about your work, don't give a shit about, do not understand, don't care. And the ability to distill that into a very clear point, be like, oh, it's about this. It's about um, a place to look at art. It's about like a warm place to sleep. It's about, um, I don't know, it's about this rich guy making more money, whatever it is you care about or not, um, is something that I think, frankly, you have to get yourself out of school thinking to realize how to do. Um, What's funny about schools, at least in the ones that I went to, and I think a lot in the US, is you're trained to be part of the art teacher profession and be part of the art teacher academy as a whole. You're not really trained necessarily to talk or even design for the public that's actually gonna use your spaces. Like that disconnect is huge, I think, across universities. And um, sorry, I, I've gone off on a big tangent from your question. Um, that is to say, I would. <laughs> I wouldn't, in a way, I don't think you'll really feel the effects of your education and it'll probably be very diffuse as you move into it. Um, I do think your first couple, first two or three professional office experiences will be really profound, I hope anyway, um, in both good and bad ways. But for whatever worth, I, I would say look forward to those. Um, and also feel like feel comfortable being like this is fucked up. I'm gonna switch out and go to another office uh, if you can. Like, don't get stuck. Oftentimes, which is very easy to get stuck. I have a more technical question. Moving away from this, um, I was wondering for your pool is the, the water from the river fil filtrated through the skin of the, the pool, like the borders? And then also in the center, are you saying that in the center you're gonna be able to like bathe in real ri river water or is it still the, f yeah. <laughs> uh, so the second question is yes, it's like pure river water. It'll okay. still be salty because the there's a bit of salinity to the river. Um, it'll still have, uh, a tint to it. So um, I don't know how to explain this without it sounding gross, but there's like biology in the river that uh, our engineers explain to, it, to, it us, to us like tea, when you kind of like see tea, the water changes color and you can't filter a lot of that color out. It won't be nearly as like brown and like dark as like what a tea would be or at what that container showed. But I do like that um, it'll have a bit of like a teal color to it or like even like a greenish color to it as opposed to this like crystal clear or blue that you see in the normal pool. Um, the filters, so the original intent was to treat the whole pool like a strainer. So you're literally bringing water in through the edges of the pool. It is still doing that in concept, but um, we're now running it through three different types of filtration media. Um, they're all basically different types of fabric. Um, uh, a lot of them are called a geotextile. It's basically like a, it's like, it looks kind of like a felt but it's basically like a pressed or woven um, fabric. The water 
in the plush shape, the water actually now moves in through the, through the perimeter, but then around the border, like under the deck, but kind of like circulates around the plush shape. Um, in the, I should probably just throw up a diagram, but in the plush shape, there's actually four um, zones of filtration. So each of those arms has its own like filtration world to it and eventually dumps clean water into the whole pool where it gets mixed up. Um, but one of the reasons for that is that in the kids' pool, for example, there's a different flow rate that you have to hit legally to call it a kid, uh, pool safe for children. So you need to like filter much faster mm -hmm. in that part than the rest. Um, so it is, it is going through the perimeter, but unfortunately it's not as direct as just coming straight in through the walls. It kind of like moves around before getting put in. Okay, thanks. But when I started it, like I had no idea. I just looked up, I think I Googled like, how does a Brita work? And <laughs> even the idea that like water passes through multiple different types of materials, like, oh shit, that's amazing. Yeah. And that led me just to like really dumb off the shelf products. Um, and in concept, it's actually no different than how a Brita works. It's just much bigger, um, <laughs> slightly different materials. <laughs> You should call it the huge Brita. Salty <laughs> <laughs> Brita. And I also have a question. Um, just in terms of the permission that you would need to like build that pool in the water, is that like a New York state sort of thing you have to deal with? Or is that like federal because it's the water? Um, luckily, we haven't had to deal with federal yet. That would freak me out. Um, but it is both state and city. So mm -hmm. for example, um, the, there's a, a number of agencies, as you can imagine. The, on the environmental side, the main agency is an agency called DEC, Department of Environmental Conservation. What's conservation? They're a state agency. And they seem to have major jurisdiction, jurisdiction across all the rivers in some way. Like they're the ones that define is this part of the river up and down New York State swimmable? Is this only for fishing? Is this too toxic? The city version of that is called Department of Environmental Protection, DEP. And in the cases of our pool, they just generally defer to DEC. They're like, if DEC is cool with it, we're cool with it. Um, so in that case, the environmental side is very much state driven um, and all the regulatory side is state driven. On the health side, that is to say that, again, we're trying to say a bather can be in this pool and it's going to be as safe and clean as a chlorinated pool. That's for the Department of Health, which is very much a city agency. Um, and their, their main gripe, of course, is that their whole job is to make sure people don't get sick or that they stay healthy. And to do that, they have to refer to their code. And their code says, you're either swimming in a place that has chlorine or you're swimming in an open beach. That's it. That's like all you can do. And so even as we're proving the science to them, you know, the people that enforce the DOH laws are like, but we don't have, you're not one of these two things. So we can't accept it right now. And so that's where the regulatory length of the regulatory work comes in is like, we have to do all this testing. We have to get third party verification. We have to like literally run a version of the pool, the filtration for six months and show them bacteria counts um, before they can even be like, okay, now let's, and then let's figure out how to write this new law. So it's a combination, sorry, long answer, but your answer is a combination. Yeah, thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, I guess we can wrap this up. I know you probably have to go. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm quarantining. I have like nothing but time right now. But okay. no, I was going to say before something, I feel free to, um, uh, you have my email, right? Like, feel free to share my email with anybody that wants it or just DM me or something. Happy to answer questions or keep conversations going. Yeah, no, thank you so much for your time and organizing this. Uh, yeah, I think it was very beneficial for everybody. Um, and yeah, thanks to everybody that's stayed so far. Uh, I know students have to go for studio probably. Um, but yeah, I guess like Dong, if you're willing to answer more questions and if people want to stay behind. Um, yeah, I have a little time. If anybody has any more questions, I'm more than happy to keep going. Um, yeah. And uh, not, that's my entry. I just say uh, I have to go. So thank you for the presentation. It was yeah. very, uh, very cool. Thank you. Um, I wanted to like.
talk again about that question about optimism. And I was thinking, and um, what I think is pretty interesting is that even when you showed your work uh, working for like doing a interior design for a store or doing a podcast, I think it's what I'm optimistic about is the fact that even with just an architecture degree, you can do so many things in the design world, be uh, constrained by just doing uh, housing buildings or like commercial buildings and you can work uh, either in fashion or in graphic design or and so that I think is very exciting because with the brown bag lecture lectures and a lot of architects we've been seeing it's like they touch so many subjects and so many fields that um, it just makes it so like diverse and yeah exciting. Thank you. I mean, yeah, I mean, totally agree. I think especially when you start working full time, um, you'll see, I think for the most part, but you'll see a kind of like split in how people want to approach their profession. And there is certainly um, a joy in being really specialist and, and an expertise in a very specific aspect, you know, whether that's only doing residential, for example, or only doing tile work or only being like the detail person in an office, um, only working with a certain material, like there is, I think, an incredible beauty with that obsession to that. Um, assuming that you're not just stuck in that track because you got stuck in that track. Um, but then there are a lot of, um, and I think it's, it tends to be younger, but um, architects and designers that, like you said, are involved with a number of non-architectural, non-strictly architectural work. Um, certainly for me, and I think relating back to one of the, um, I think it was the answer I gave to Isabel's question. Um, talking to architects only gets really boring really quick. So like even just meeting people and trying to engage with people that are not architects, frankly for me is like the only way just not to go insane. So um, like I, like when we started getting into fashion work or starting to um, get into other disciplines, a lot of it for me was just like out of curiosity of how they ran, how those people kind of operated and how they designed things and their methods. And, um, you know, one of the, one of the direct things was when we were doing um, the stage set for Kanye was to see how uh, tour stage people and stage builders built things and production teams in the scenographic and entertainment world, how they made physical giant things happen a hundred times faster than contractors would in an architectural project. Obviously they're for very different things. Like it's in a very controlled environment. They're just for temporary things. But it was immediately clear that like, simply because of how they worked, they were able to pull off stuff that no contractor just because they thought differently could ever pull off. Um, no matter how much time was given. And I think that was also like, can we start, you know, dumbly, like, could you start building things faster? Could you start building things quicker? Can you start building things temporarily that get dismantled in six hours in the way that a stage set does? Um, like you saw it was possible, whether or not it transited 100% in architecture was unknown, but um, it was only because I think we wanted just to like not talk to architects anymore. <laughs> architects get boring really quickly, I would say. I guess maybe if I can jump in kind of going on the tangent of like more of the employment side of things. I'm also graduating from my undergraduate degree this semester. And I guess like the narrative in general is somewhat pessimistic, I guess, coming out right now, especially with like a pandemic happening. There's cons to like, oh, should I do my master's right away? Because now we're going to do our master's online and I'm not really liking online education or do I risk it and try and find a job because it's COVID. So like maybe there's not a lot of jobs out there. I guess I was just as someone kind of like actually out working, what is your general experience of like the sentiment that's happening out there? We had a guest lecture one time and being like, oh, there's tons of jobs. Like our firm just hired 10 employees. And then you hear other things where it's like, I can't find a job anywhere. So I don't know, there's just so much, I guess, anxiety and uncertainty with graduating right now, but. Yeah, yeah. I, what I'm noticing is Actually, surprisingly, offices have been surviving and some are starting to get really busy again. Um, 
I think the offices that did really well and continue to do well um, are primarily residential uh, and, and like small scale residential. And as dumb as it is, it's like, I think it's literally just people are stuck at home. So they're looking at their kitchen. They're like, I want to renovate this thing. And offices that work at that scale are picking up a lot of work. Um, to the previous question, I think a lot of offices, you know, like Jonathan, excuse me, I mentioned Jonathan Jackson earlier, his office, we should do it all. His whole MO is that we should do it all. And actually offices like that, that are able to now work in um, branding or grab things that are not physically built things are also doing really, really well. Um, like our friends at Play Lab, who have since they moved to LA, they've been insanely busy because they do a lot of um, brand campaign work. Um, this is not to say that you necessarily want to do this coming out of architecture school, but if you're interested in especially kind of getting into fields that are not strictly architecture, there's a lot of offices that I think cross that boundary. Um, as dumb as it is, like a lot of like businesses are still trying to sell you shit. They're just not trying to sell you shit in a store yet, um, like at least on the, on the commercial side. Um, I think major projects, I'm guessing that at the beginning of this year and certainly at the end of last year, kind of big institutional or cultural projects like museums are probably slow to start up again, just because I think people are waiting to see where their finances sit before committing to a new capital project or something like this. Um, but there is, I think there's a lot of small scale work that's going through. Um, someone explained it to me that really rich people are still really rich. Uh, and so that stuff from a business standpoint can sustain offices pretty well. Again, it may not be the work you necessarily want to commit your life's work to, but um, a lot of the benefit of that kind of work is it's work that can happen fairly quickly. So you can see a cycle of a project, you know, stores happen in like six months. You can see beginning to end construction. You can see um, a house being renovated within like a year or two and get a full breadth of detailing and construction knowledge fairly quickly. Um, as long as I think you're conscious of, and you don't have to be conscious on the onset, you may actually learn that you love doing kitchen detailing like halfway through, I might um, But as long as you're conscious of like, is this actually keeping me happy like a year or two in and then trying to switch if you can't. But I think there is work. I don't, I would not be surprised if there is less work in a lot of the like, cultural sector and the arts sector. Um, I can imagine that there's gonna be a lot of work in rebuilding of offices to make them pandemic friendly or, or post COVID friendly. Whether that's interesting design or whether that's kind of like technical dealing with mechanical systems and ventilation, I'm not sure. Um, and I think there may be already a lot of work with um, well, this is, I guess, US specific. The understanding is that with the Biden administration coming in and coming out of the pandemic, there's gonna be a lot of infrastructural work. So like city planning scale stuff. So there's a lot of offices also that, you know, touch on everything from a home into like designing the airport. Um, I think there's opportunities there. So I, I, I guess it is to say, it's like, I think there is both jobs and also some offices are not hiring at all. So. <laughs> And I guess like along with the kind of like what you were mentioning, there's so many different sectors that you can enter into. I feel like comes another big topic that I feel like gets talked about amongst like students themselves is the idea of like work culture and like what's acceptable and maybe what's not. Because I think in architecture, we have like a very like big acceptance of like 24 hour round the clock working. And it's kind of like, that's just like how it is. And we're kind of, that's a, a weird consensus of it's okay. And then now we're kind of starting to be like, I don't, 24 hours all every day, like for seven days a week is like not a sustainable lifestyle and it's not really healthy. And like, we need to push and have like a transformation in the social acceptance of that within architecture. And I guess kind of just like, to what degree is it like, what, how do you feel about that? Because I think there's so many discussions around those topics about work culture in general and like what we as students should accept when we enter the workforce. Um, um. I think it's total bullshit. I think that way of working is completely useless. Um, yeah. And partially it's because I went through that coming out of school. Um, 
for a number of years. The one benefit, which is a weird thing to call it a benefit, is that you get very close to the people you work with. And so that kind of intensity of culture is really strong. Like some of my closest friends in architecture are still the ones that I work with in that kind of environment. Having said that, you have like no life outside of that, which is also why you end up being really close to these people. But no, I wouldn't say in, in terms of quality of work, certainly in terms of like lifestyle quality, uh, you are not getting better work by working 18 hour a day, seven days a week. Um, how we work, we, well, especially in the middle of like working from home is um, we actually keep fairly normal hours. It's basically 10 to like six. Um, we rarely work weekends. Um, I think someone maybe worked on a Saturday once in the last like six months, four months maybe. Unfortunately, she's been really busy with her project, so <laughs> she's like a special case. Um, and then we actually implemented a thing now where uh, Fridays, we call independent Fridays. So we're still paying everybody full five days, but that Friday is yours to use how you want. And with the one caveat that it has to be pursuing an architecture project of your own or an architecture related project. Um, and so um, one person is rebuilding a shed in the community garden behind his house. One person is designing a chair for their home. Um, uh, Bello, again, who's on this call, is making a film um, about an architect and an artist. And the assumption was that um, the kind of initiative side of that will benefit the office a lot more in terms of people driving projects in different directions and in ways that they want, more than even working that extra five, fifth day on that Friday. And we, I don't think we've seen any production slow down. Um, if anything, you know you need to get stuff done in four days and you just get it done more efficiently. So I don't, I don't think there's, I really don't think there's any usage to that culture of working except as collateral punishment for being treated that way when you were going through school or work yourself. It's just like, it's like a power move basically. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, for sure. I feel like a lot of the times we kind of like hear it proliferated through generations of like older instructors being like, well, I went through that and then I went through that. And it's almost like, oh, now you're going through it too. And it's almost like that's your like ticket into the acceptance of like the culture of architecture, which seems like a little bit toxic and problematic, especially when promoting like a healthier lifestyle for students. And now amidst a pandemic when everyone's isolated on their own and there's so many other things. But yeah, no, it's it's just interesting because it's like a social shift within the field itself that I think is like kind of hard to to push for and like assert yourself, especially as like a young student kind of thing. So, but yeah, it's definitely. And I, I, I feel like I'm hearing, you know, at least I'm hearing um, young designers at large offices that are notorious for this kind of thing starting to like push back. Mm -hmm. I'm guessing it'll take a while for the industry to shift, if at all. Um, yeah. oh, I, you, I think there is a worthwhile trade, not a worthwhile, there is, I think, like a consideration to take that there may be an office you really want to work at um, and certain products that you really want to be a part of and you're willing just to sacrifice that for a couple of years. I mean, again, it's, it's very individual, but I would not say that it's, it's certainly not a mandatory way of working to produce good architecture. Um, some offices just don't work any other way and, and you're never gonna get them to change. Um, but again, I think just take it for what it is and, and realize that you're only gonna put in a certain amount of time. Um, but again, yeah, I don't think it's a necessary way to work. Yeah, for sure. Thank you so much. Cool. Any other questions? Yes, I have a question. Um, I think the first project you presented, uh, it was like a bathhouse and you didn't talk much about it, but we're like actually doing a, in our studio a bathhouse. So I was wondering if you could uh, give us more information on like your concept and ideas. Uh, yeah. Um, so I am actually currently in the Cayman Islands a block away from the site, which is like behind here. Um, and obviously there's other reasons to come down to the Cayman Islands in the middle of a pandemic, but the main reason is to start construction on the site. And the site is, um, 
I want to say it's about 10,000 square feet. I should probably know the numbers better off the top of my head. Um, but it is part of a hotel. So there's a hotel down here called Palm Heights. And um, they've been running a kind of fitness and health and like wellness program for a little, for a couple of years now. And this will be the first like physical manifestation, like dedicated place for that. Um, the concept really was, you know, like I'm sure you're kind of seeing you go through the bus project. Like it's so sensorial. Everything is so like um, atmospheric, yeah. temperature based, humidity based, very body focused. And so instead of controlling that through artificial means, when you're down here, like it's incredibly humid and hot anyway. Basically, it's a lot of perfect temperatures for a lot of the bathhouse functions. So really all we wanted to do was like, can you stay outdoors? Can you create as much outdoorness to this bathhouse idea as possible? As opposed to like going into, you know, like the Turkish hammam style, you go into a very like beautiful, but like very encased mm -hmm. building. Yeah. And so this was trying to be the opposite. Um, the concept is again, pretty simple. It's like, if you just imagine a giant hedge that you kind of carve out. So it's, it's a combination of like, um, it's basically like a Versailles-ish version of a bathhouse. Mm -hmm. So we're just carving faces out of, out of hedges. Almost all the walls are just planted um, hedges for privacy, obviously. Mm -hmm. um, and then um, uh, there's a central pool in the middle. And otherwise there's, I think, a hammam, mud baths, sauna, spa, a bunch of rooms for treatments and massages, um, a big gym on one side. Um, for weights and kind of like free weight stuff. Um, but the hope is also that um, it's an environment, it's very social. It's meant to be incredibly loud, well, incredibly loud, but like loud and, and sort of active. And so it also creates an, an alternative to just hanging out at the beach, which is obviously what you do in the Cayman Islands, mm -hmm. um, actually hanging out in a garden across the street. Mm -hmm. um, I think it's actually posted on our site. So there's more images you can find at, at our site. Um, but no, I think it's actually one of currently, you know, under construction, certainly one of more, more interesting projects because it's all plants. So like even the idea of the thing, like when it first opens, it won't be fully mature yet. Like the plants mm -hmm. will be short. You're gonna have to literally trim this building all the time, which I sort yeah. of love, um, that it will get more filled out over the first couple of years. Um, funnily, I was like, if there's, cause every once in a while, you know, you'll get um, hurricanes coming through Cayman. There was a devastating one, I think, about 15 years ago. And there hasn't been a major one really since, but, but the idea that this thing could, like the leaves could just get blown off this thing, mm -hmm. cracks me up. <laughs> like it wouldn't be great, I think, for the function of it, but I like that it's very susceptible to the weather and the climate and, and all that. And um, yeah, I mean, I think the hope is that you feel like you're basically just in a garden. Mm -hmm. um, just sweating profusely. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you. Yeah. Cool. Well, thanks, everybody. Um, again, yeah, hit me up if there's any other questions. And if you're about to graduate, good luck. Um, try that list. There might be offices on that list that are hiring. Um, I'm hoping that we're going to see more optimism in the profession in terms of people hiring and kind of commissioning people to do work again in the next few months. I feel like there's a, probably a lot of bated breath, frankly, up until yesterday in the US. Um, and whether or not people feel more relieved now, we'll see. Um, the good thing is we've noticed, at least in our office, most new work comes in now-ish, like basically beginning of the year. I think clients are like, oh, it's a new year. Let's get something started weather is turning good. And so hypothetically come April, May, June, uh, offices can start staffing up again. There's always a weird period I notice where like we sometimes need bodies, bodies, sorry, that was terrible. We need people <laughs> in like March and people are not graduated yet. Um, but anyway, I think it, it generally builds up into summer. And so hopefully there's more prospects than there are right now, for example. But, um, the other thing is if, um, follow up quite a bit with offices that you like. Um, conditions change really quickly, especially for the smaller offices. They can change like week to week or month to month in terms of whether they have capacity to hire or not. 
um, I'm trying to think, oh, Bella left, but I'm trying to think if we've ever been, I don't think I've ever been overly annoyed by someone that follows up a lot in order to not hire them. Um, we'll get annoyed, but if they're good, they're good and we'll want to talk to them. Um, and it's, it is very much like, you know, a long list of people sending in portfolios and oftentimes it's just like, oh, I just remember the latest one that came in. So check up on the offices you like a lot. Um, just because an office, do the same thing. Just an office tells you we're gonna archive this file it away, we'll visit it. You won't. <laughs> so bug them, bug them a lot. Cool, thanks again. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank yeah. you so much.